understanding climate change from an economic perspective. We read terrifying stories about climate change in the news every day. The human race will undoubtedly disappear in about a dozen years. The glaciers will melt, the forests will burn or wither, and the oceans will expand quickly, drowning us. Now is the time to act because it might already be too late. According to the media, we must instantly switch to renewable energy. We must outlaw the use of coal power, burning of wood, plastic disposables, eating meat, flying, and other polluting activities. Politicians and environmentalists are turning to you and telling you to get ready for major changes in your lifestyle because if you don't, you and all future generations will be condemned to a life in a polluted desert. All of this sounds quite threatening, but acting on impulse is never a good idea. Fortunately, we'll put things in perspective for you and give you the chance to form an informed decision. How does the climate change? The current weather is merely one aspect of climate change. Unlike climate change, which is a modification of typical weather that takes place over millions of years, changes in the current weather are brief and transient. The atmosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, glaciers and permafrost, biosphere and lithosphere, or the planet's outer shell, make up the climate system. The sun provides the majority of its energy, and it also gives some energy back to the universe. As a result, it is possible to claim that the Earth has an energy budget. The climate system will warm if it holds on to more energy than it releases. In the alternative, the weather will become cooler. We are currently experiencing a time of global warming, says the so-called scientific consensus, which is mostly related to the IPCC2 reports. The IPCC emphasizes that the expansion of the human economy is the primary cause of warming, despite the fact that variations in solar, volcanic, or marine activity, among others, do contribute to it. Since the Industrial Revolution, greenhouse gas emissions by humanity as a whole have increased significantly. And compared to the 1850 to 1900 period at the start of the Industrial Revolution, the average temperature during the present decade has risen by almost 0.93 degrees Celsius. The last three decades have each seen an increase in temperature, meaning that the climate system has stored more energy than it has released. Other aspects of the climate system will change as a result of rising temperatures. In accordance with the most recent IPCC report, atmospheric phenomena fluctuate more. Melting glaciers cause global waters to rise by 19 centimeters between 1901 and 2010, and the oceans are getting warmer by 0.11 degrees Celsius per decade between 1971 and 2010, more acidified and changing in salinity. These changes affect both the evaporation of water forming clouds and the circulation of oceanic currents. As a result, rivers and other bodies of water will overflow more frequently, destroying coastlines and increasing the frequency of droughts and forest fires. Arable agricultural ecosystems in forests and on the water will also be impacted. Although this final category of harms may end up being the most significant because it may directly harm economic success, we should not ignore other effects, particularly those on health. What makes it intriguing? There are two reasons why the issue of anthropogenic or man-made climate change is significant. First, since we are to blame, we might be able to find a solution. Second, it affects ourselves and future generations. We must reassure you, even though the media is keen to frighten us with stories about the end of the earth and all known life, the power of humanity is not great. Even if all 15,000 of the Earth's nuclear bombs were to be detonated by politicians, the most hazardous organisms on the planet, the planet's mantle or top layer, would remain intact. What about our alleged capacity to eradicate all life? The most hardy creatures would easily survive the nuclear Armageddon, including rats, cockroaches, tardigrades, and particularly organisms residing at the bottom of the oceans and in the scorching vents of active volcanoes. For humans, the knowledge that the cockroaches will live is not particularly comforting. We, as a species, are more concerned with our own survival and with good reason. Although the IPCC is aware of additional dangers, its primary concern is the evaluation of the economic and societal effects of climate change. 
The IPCC warns us that a scarcity of drinking water, combined with rising humidity, warmth, and pollution may impair human health, and that decreased productivity of food sources such as fisheries and grain, rice, and maize crops may result in food shortages. Furthermore, flooding that alters coastlines, heat waves, fires, pest infestations, disease outbreaks, abrupt storms, or high humidity will devastate our capital and even entire economies and ecosystems. Lack of food and water, as well as structural and financial damage, are problems in rural communities. However, they predict a slowdown in economic growth and the impoverishment of weaker nations, whose citizens will find it more difficult to emigrate from particularly afflicted places. The total economic harm is difficult to measure, according to IPCC experts. Economic shocks and poverty-related conflicts are predicted to occur more frequently. But hold on. Why did the experts place such a heavy emphasis on the economic impact? There is an easy solution. When it comes to assessing the social significance of such challenges, economics is unrivaled. Living expenses, potential earnings and wages, or capital assets are examples of monetary values that provide valuable information on the state of society. Even health losses can be estimated by taking into account the price of insurance and medical care. Through gain and loss calculations in the timber, agricultural, or cattle industries, even forest damage or wildlife mortality can be partially translated into financial value. Without economics, we would be forced to rely on qualitative, subjective evaluations that lack a common denominator. Instead, we can combine various individual preferences to form intersubjective evaluations using pricing or economic indices like the GDP or CPI. An economics lesson. The impact of climate change as determined by IPCC models is not as bad as what is depicted in the media or even in summaries of the very same models, according to American economist Robert P. Murphy. For instance, the IPCC report predicts that despite climatic change, the overall number and proportion of hungry children in poorer nations will decrease by 9.4 million in the 50 years following the year 2000. The WHO predicts a 30% reduction in disease-related health consequences by 2030 compared to 2004. Our children will still be healthier than we are, and technological advancement, along with the accumulation of wealth, will make it easier for them to cope with climate change. Even if some of the worst IPCC scenarios come true, within a century, our descendants will only be only 8.5 times richer than us, compared to 9.5 times if no harmful climate change would occur. Murphy's estimates show that the estimated cost in terms of GDP impact, including health consequences and mortality rate, in the IPCC's worst-case scenario 5 of the temperature increasing by 2.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 would be at most 2.5%. The cost of initiatives that attempt to keep temperature increases brought on by greenhouse gas emissions under 2 degrees Celsius throughout this time is estimated by the IPCC report to be roughly 3.4% of GDP. This basically means that the cost would be lower, equivalent to at most 2.5% of GDP, if politicians decided not to take any action at all, allowing temperatures to rise by 2.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 then the cost of programs aiming to limit temperature increases to 2 degrees alone, equivalent to at least 3.4% of GDP. The outlook through the year 2100 is comparable. According to the IPCC's worst-case scenario, a temperature increase of 4.9 degrees Celsius results in losses of almost 4.6% of GDP. Meanwhile, in 2100, the cost of limiting emissions will be equivalent to 4.8% of GDP. The implementation of these measures would therefore still result in a net loss in 2050 and in 2100, even if all other costs or consequences of climate change were ignored. As a thought experiment, consider whether a total eradication of emissions entails a halt to global warming or a return to conditions from before the 19th century. Additional Dangers some skeptics contend that either the IPCC models overstate costs while underestimating the feasibility of lowering emissions, or they underestimate the likelihood of unexpected catastrophic repercussions of climate change. Let's examine both claims. 
Martin Weitzman, a mathematician, physicist, and economist who passed away, was a staunch supporter of the first assertion. He basically stated that the most extreme disasters are not considered in the current cost-benefit models. Let's say that, in the unlikely event that it occurs, the next gram of CO2 released by mankind will end human civilization. Weitzman contends that we must understand the infinite cost of destroying humankind. As a result, while having a very low probability, the anticipated value of this circumstance is equal to it is equal to infinite loss because, when multiplied by infinite cost, a tiny chance of 0.000001 still equals infinite cost. The arithmetic forces us to conclude that any action that eliminates this remote probability is profitable, so long as it doesn't incur infinite costs. Even if taking such action results in the imminent return of humans to caves and the obliteration of the whole industry that produces CO2, Although this logic could be intriguing as a morbid mathematical exercise, we should proceed cautiously when considering such absurd claims. Economic theory does not depend on experimentation. Because Weitzman's thought experiment simulates a closed world rather than an open one, admits only two pre-existing possibilities, and presupposes that no novel solutions to the problem exist, it comes out as contrived and doubtful. Any economist should also look into how Weitzman determined the expected value. Did Weitzman take into account the subjective nature of human judgments and temporal preference? Could it be that our general lack of concern for very implausible threats is evidence of human common sense rather than human irrationality? Or perhaps we automatically overlook such risks in our internal cost and benefit calculations because we are aware that doing differently would be futile. Instead, we keep working to find solutions to our everyday issues in the hopes that tomorrow will come. Another query, on which of the several potential threats should we concentrate? Should we disregard climate change and rush to create space technologies to avert a disaster brought on by an asteroid impact? Or perhaps we ought to redirect our entire economy into building an orbital barrier to shelter humanity from possible catastrophic solar storms? And what about unlikely but potential alien invasions? Or perhaps we ought to rebel against Weitzman's plans since there is a remote chance that they might end humankind as we know it. Is it worthwhile to take into account every conceivable but obviously ludicrous scenario? Consider these queries in light of the surrounding information. What about the issue where the current models overestimate expenses while underestimating the potential for carbon reductions? Alexander Barron, who addressed the issue at the American Congress and then under the auspices of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, described the issue in Nature. It is notable in particular because it raises a fresh line of inquiry. On the one hand, scientific consensus models typically overlook the potential for technology advancements and market adaptation to climate change. Barron uses the coal market as an example. On the other hand, these models fail to take into account potential low-cost emission reduction strategies. Planning for the economy is a challenge. Here, even with the greatest of intentions, we hit the fundamental issue that plagues all economists who attempt to create the economy of the future. In actuality, attempting to plan a precise economic strategy based on even the finest economic models is just as unpredictable as trying to plan a lengthy international journey based on even the greatest weather projections. Top-down economic planning is a fool's errand, as noted by the famous economists Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. This is especially true if the plan extends tens or hundreds of years into the future. Of course, it's obvious that the majority of the political plans put up by economists and politicians are very different from socialism. These people do not desire to control all exchange rates and pricing. They have much more reasonable goals than that. Many of them believe that the so-called Pigovian tax, which levies a fee on undesired actions like the production of greenhouse gases, is the best option. The chosen emission target is used to determine the tax's level. But the issue is right here. The policymaker must evaluate the net present value, NPV, which economists refer to as the present worth of future income from climate change mitigation measures, and contrast it with the current cost of these programs in order to appropriately establish the tax. This is problematic because, depending on how significant we consider the future revenue streams, or, more specifically, depending on the choice of the discount rate used to determine their present monetary value, 
This present value may change arbitrarily. Politicians place a higher value on the future of future generations, which results in a higher tax burden on current generations. Even the modest expenses of some basic climate protection would be too great if the bureaucrats underestimate these future revenues. As you can see, the tax's quantity is determined by the officials' choices. The real market rates of return on investment, however, clearly illustrate the preferences of the entire society with regard to potential future sources of income. By making investments or by foregoing current spending to boost future consumption, market participants continuously indicate their choice for the future. We can simply acknowledge that climate change adaptation or mitigation is a worthwhile investment when everyone in our community understands how crucial it is to protect future generations. Political decisions neglect societal decisions about the future in this way. The insurance market and, given the right legal framework, class action lawsuits against poisoners, similar to past lawsuits against the tobacco industry, are two methods we already have for evaluating the relative importance of climate change to various individuals in a decentralized and bottom-up manner. We can also employ the arguments put forth by government organizations like the IPCC. If they were effective in persuading politicians, why not use them to persuade juries and judges in cases involving polluters? The inherent inefficiency of large-scale political initiatives is the final issue. We cannot allow us to fool ourselves. Facts exist on the indifference and inefficiency of bureaucracy in all fields. And in reality, a small number of governments that wish to boost their tax collections and gain a competitive edge by decreasing emission standards in order to attract polluting firms can successfully undercut even a legitimate political consensus. Such methods have a propensity to proliferate. This regulatory leakage can swiftly render any political agreement on emission limitations illegal. Just consider modern China or the United States as examples. Political constraints on entrepreneurship may soon be revealed to be a fruitless endeavor that only serves to stifle innovation. And inventions that can counteract the negative impacts of climate change are produced via innovation. By eschewing central planning in favor of market-based solutions, we may yet be able to avert the calamity. Consistent application of property rights enables us to use legal tools like class action lawsuits to kickstart appropriate gain and loss analyses on the one side and entrepreneurial innovation to mitigate or adapt to climate change on the other. In addition, remember that if you enjoyed this video, you can show your support by clicking the like button, sharing it with your peers, and leaving a comment to tell us what you think. The success of our content is contingent upon your participation. Do not neglect to click the subscribe button for more economics education explanations.